Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to familiar territory, a place where bears can be very angry if they are disturbed, surprised, or just having a bad day. Well, I guess that describes anywhere that bears reside, so specifically, we are going to the Madison Valley in western Montana. This area may sound familiar if you have watched our episode regarding the fatal grizzly mauling on Charles Mock because it happened only a few miles away. The Madison Valley is just across the good side of the border of Idaho and Montana and is within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which sprawls across the northwest corner of Wyoming, the southwest corner of Montana, and the northeast corner of Idaho, well past the park boundaries. In this area, the needs of people and bears are precariously balanced by regulations, laws, and constraints on human activity. You might even say that only the foolhardy would adventure into grizzly country here, even if they are well prepared. The Madison Valley stretches north from the park toward a small farming town called Ennis. In the broad valley, the land is flat and covered with grasses and sagebrush that antelope and coyotes dash across. As the valley inclines to peaks that reach around 10,000 feet in elevation, stands of fir, pine, aspen, and spruce cover the ground in a green blanket that hides mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and moose. The predators of this area include cougars, wolves, black bears, and grizzly bears. To clarify the difference between a brown bear and a grizzly bear, grizzly bears are brown bears, but the name is typically used to reference smaller and more aggressive inland brown bears who usually do not have the benefit of a seasonal salmon run to fatten up like the coastal brownies do along the west coast of Canada and Alaska. Their life is more demanding given they have to compete over the same food sources as black bears and even some that wolves and cougars eat. With four large apex predators in this area, it is no wonder that sow grizzlies defend the lives of their cubs with such ferocity and power. In the early morning twilight of October 1, 2016, 50-year-old Todd Orr was planning on using a day off from work to go scouting for elk hunting season. Todd is a fit and tough trail engineer. Whenever a park system or national forest wants to install a new trail route, they call Todd, and he examines the topography and destinations of the proposed trail and designs routes that provide the best views and connect to the existing trails. He was raised in Bozeman, and like so many other people from the area, loved it so much he never left. Todd has found one of those jobs that aren't work because he gets to do what he loves, which is being outdoors. He is an avid hunter and fly fisherman and hikes for relaxation and exercise. His job allows him to pursue his favorite pastimes, which include designing and building custom knives. On his scouting excursion, he was packing a 10mm pistol and his bear spray because he is a realist and knows that a bear can be anywhere in this area. His handgun is stashed in a chest holster and his bear spray is holstered on his right hip for easy and quick access. He is also very well versed in reading a bear's body language and behavior to ascertain what their state of mind might be. As a precaution to avoid running into a moose or a bear, Todd yelled out, Hey, bear! every few minutes as he climbed the trail into the high country to make sure any nearby animals know he is there. About three miles up the trail, Todd entered a small clearing and noticed on the other side, about 80 yards away, a large grizzly bear, as well as her two little cubs. The cubs were born in the past winter and were probably about nine months old by now, weighing around 20 to 25 pounds. As soon as the sow and cubs saw Todd, they immediately headed in the opposite direction, giving him a false sense of security at the thought of their apparent retreat from a human presence. Little did Todd know the sow had headed her cubs up the hill a bit and ordered them up a tree. Then she circled back toward him. As Todd patiently waited to see where the bears had gone, she bore down on him and closed the distance with stunning speed. As Todd continued up the trail, he briefly looked at the ground as he stepped and suddenly heard a noise above him on the hill. He quickly glanced up and saw the 400-pound furious sow grizzly focused on him, eyes burning with rage. She was hell-bent on taking out what she perceived as a threat to her cubs, and nothing could change her mind. Just to understand a protective mama bear's perspective a bit, let's take a second to discuss why they react the way they do to perceived threats. In the bear world, the greatest threat to those tiny cute bear cubs is a big old grumpy boar who is driven by, let's say, biological urges. 
Somehow boars know that if they kill a sow's cubs, she will be brought back into heat, or a state of biological readiness to mate. The boar will get to feed off of the cubs and sometime later get the chance of breeding her. Female bears know this and react to any threat to their cubs, real or imagined, with a near-nuclear display of power and aggression. A sow grizzly has even been filmed sprinting a quarter mile down a steep incline to climb a tree to attack and kill a boar black bear after smelling his scent on the breeze. They do not know mercy or tolerance when it comes to anything that can harm their cubs. Todd began to shout at the sow as soon as he saw her charging toward him. Hoping she may have misunderstood what he was, he waved his arms and yelled to show her he was a harmless human and not a threatening boar. Well, Todd didn't get to wave his arms more than just a few times before he realized this sow was not bluff charging. When a bear bluff charges, they tend to bounce and peek at what they are headed toward, as if searching for more information. When a bear is not bluff charging, their eyes are fixed on their target and there is no hesitation in their approach. He quickly reached down to pull out his can of bear spray and flick the trigger guard off in a practiced motion. Bear spray manufacturers recommend discharging the noxious cloud of irritant when the bear is within 25 to 35 feet for optimal effect. Todd estimated that he discharged his bear spray when the sow was 25 feet from him. He watched as the orange cloud billowed from the canister and settled into a hazy layer of hopeful protection between him and the sow, hoping and expecting, but really hoping that the bear would get a snoot full of that cloud and decide she didn't want to mess with anything that painful. Todd's hopes were terrifyingly dashed when the sow blurred right through the cloud as if it wasn't there. The bear spray had no immediate effect on the sow and she shoved Todd to the ground. Todd knew he had to protect his neck and head most and curled up into a ball with his hands covering his neck. With his face in the dirt, the bear rapidly and repeatedly bit his left arm several times and bit his back a few times as well. She fortunately took out some of her frustration on his backpack, which prevented even more damage to Todd's vulnerable body. The sow bit into Todd to try to elicit a reaction and waited a few seconds, then bit again in another location on his body. She did this several times over a few minutes before she started coughing in response to the bear spray emitted earlier. She broke off the attack and coughed her way back up the hill and toward her cubs. Now relieved by the departure of the sow and bewildered at how he was still alive, Todd slowly made it back to his feet. His eyes and legs worked fine, even though his arm and shoulder were severely and repeatedly bitten. He knew he had to get off that hill and back to his truck to get to medical help soon, and started jogging back down the trail. After he covered a couple hundred yards, Todd decided he had better check out his injuries. He could see blood seeping from several puncture wounds on his arms and shoulder, but knew these were not life-threatening. He thanked God out loud that they weren't worse as he briskly hiked. The most important thing to him right now was not to bandage his wounds, but to get as far away as he could from that angry sow as quickly as possible. Several minutes down the trail, Todd heard another noise behind him and saw a blur out of the corner of his left eye. About thirty feet from him, the sow had returned and was now charging him again at full speed. The feeling of elation at getting off so easy on the first attack drained from his body as he had no bear spray this time, and the sow was not slowing down as she approached him. Todd again assumed the position he had used earlier to protect his neck and head. He flopped face first into the ground and wrapped his arms around his neck and head in anticipation of the follow-up attack. As she approached him, the sow used his shoulders as a stopping pad as she placed both her paws on them, crushing him into the ground. Her teeth again pierced the flesh of his arms and shoulders with bites Todd described as being hit by a sledgehammer with teeth. As she drove her canines through his forearm, Todd heard his bones pop from the bite pressure. Everything from the point of the bite to his fingertips went numb and limp, flopping uselessly as he struggled to cover himself. As the pain from the bite to his forearm shot through his body, Todd let out a gasp and twitched in response. This was the proof of life the sow needed to re-energize her attack on him. She quickly bit him hard, several times all over his shoulders and upper back. Todd fought the instinct to react to the pain. Each time he gasped or twitched in reaction to the bites, the sow would follow up with several more bites. He tried to lay still as she began to chew on his head, now that his arm was limp and not protecting it. On about her third bite to Todd's head, he felt a flood of warm blood pour over his face. She had opened up a deep gash about five inches long, just above his ear, and partially displaced a small patch of his scalp. 
The pictures of this wound are gory, to say the least, and would not pass YouTube scrutiny, so I have posted them on my Patreon, which is linked below, along with other pictures from Todd's attack. They are fairly gut-wrenching, so view them at your own risk. They do show you just how thick the scalp tissues are on a human being, which is quite interesting, but yet yeah, definitely not for young people to see. After feeling such a flood of blood flow into his eyes and down his face, Todd was certain the sow was going to finish him off this time. He helplessly awaited a crushing bite to his skull as he resigned to the fact the sow grizzly was going to kill him. Apparently tearing a man limb from limb can be exhausting, even for an enormous apex predator. The sow suddenly stopped after nearly scalping Todd and pressed her full weight onto his back, crushing the air from his lungs. He knew if he so much as twitched, she might renew her attack, so he laid still, listening to the silence interrupted only by the sounds of the sow breathing heavily and sniffing him. Her warm breath pelted the back of his neck rhythmically as she assessed if Todd was dead and the threat to her cubs ended. Her paws were pressed into his lower back, and he could feel them digging into his flesh as she angrily watched him for any sign of life. The putrid scent of the sow filled Todd's nostrils and made resisting any movement even more difficult. The sow remained positioned this way over Todd for about thirty seconds. As suddenly as she appeared, she disappeared. Undoubtedly, concern for her cubs had changed her focus now that Todd had ceased all movement. She had proven her point to Todd and any boar grizzlies that may have seen her violent intent to protect her cubs. Todd wanted to see where the sow was, but was too afraid to move. His eyes were full of his own blood, which completely obscured any detail in his vision. He knew he wouldn't survive a third round with the angry sow and slowly maneuvered his arm beneath his chest in search of his 10 mm pistol. It was gone. Wiping the blood from his eyes, Todd lifted his head, searching for the solace of knowing the sow had, in fact, finally left him. He searched the ground around him and located his pistol still in its holster only five feet away. During the attack, the sow had cut the binding to his holster, holding it to his chest, allowing it to tumble the short distance. His backpack was mutilated and served as a harbinger of the damage that would have otherwise been done to his back. Todd quickly gathered up his scattered belongings and resumed his descent toward his truck. Blood poured from the gash above his ear and the twenty-five other bites all over his body. He knew he had about 45 more minutes of hiking before reaching safety and determined that he wasn't about to let himself bleed out without trying to make it. He resumed alternating between brisk hiking and jogging back down the trail. When Todd reached the trailhead he could see another vehicle parked near his own. His mind immediately jumped to the thought of that person also running into the angry sow. He had the wherewithal to pull out his cell phone and immediately record the results of the day's adventure on it as he dripped blood all over the cab of his truck. A short distance down the road, Todd approached a rancher. He waved the rancher down and asked him to call the hospital to let them know he was coming and would need immediate medical care. Just to prove how tough he was, Todd called his girlfriend as soon as he got reception on his cell phone. He calmly asked her how her day was going and asked her if she wouldn't mind bringing him a change of clothes to the hospital. When Todd pulled up to the hospital, he was met by a full medical team as well as a police officer. He asked the officer to open his truck door, put his truck in park, and unfasten his seat belt, since his left arm was numb and useless. The officer was glad to see that through it all, Todd had still remembered to buckle his seat belt. Todd was rushed inside and an assessment was underway to get a good measure of the damage the sow had done to his body. His limp left wrist was x-rayed, and it was noted that the bear had chipped his ulna when biting into it, causing the nerves that controlled his wrist and hand to stop working. It took the medical team eight hours to stitch up all of Todd's wounds where his flesh was punctured and torn by the bear's powerful jaws. By morning time, Todd's bruises were a dark palette of green, purple, and blue and covered his entire upper arm, shoulders, and parts of his back. Many of the bruises were due to bites that didn't quite puncture or tear his skin, but nonetheless ruptured blood vessels underneath. Dark bruises in the shape of bear paws had emerged from where the bear stood on his back while waiting for him to move. From being crushed into the ground by the sow, Todd had bruises all over his face and chest as well. In typical tough Montanan fashion, Todd described the day's events as not his best day and expressed gratitude at being alive to share this moment with his loved ones. Madison County Sheriff Roger Thompson urged Todd to buy a lottery ticket, stating that luck had to be on his side to survive two bear attacks on the same day. 
Sheriff Thompson likened Todd's attack to being struck by lightning twice on the same day. Todd's girlfriend added to the comedy by stating that it looked like he had gutted an elk in the driver's seat of his truck. Todd Orr did everything he was supposed to do, right down to having the discipline and self-control to lay still while being bitten 25 times by the angry sow. Todd was grateful that there was no one else with him when he encountered the sow and her cubs. He knew he would do anything to protect his friends, just like that sow had risked her life defending her cubs. Todd is committed to continue hiking and hunting as soon as he has recovered from his injuries. He even went out fly fishing while his left arm was still in a splint, in the episode regarding Bram Schaefer's grizzly bear attack, while he was elk hunting with his father, the toughness of folks from Montana was showcased, and Todd Orr's attack reinforces just how tough they are. Regarding the sow and her cubs, there was a brief discussion amongst the officials on what action they should take to address her aggressive behavior. I could find no source indicating that she and her cubs were ever pursued, collared, or killed, and assume she was left alone to raise her babies in peace. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Was it the same bear that attacked Todd twice, or did he run into a second angry grizz? Do you think that Todd deployed his bear spray at the correct distance, or did he deploy it too early? Do you think the bear took it easy on Todd, or was she trying to kill him? Are you surprised the bear attacked him again after being sprayed with bear spray? Do you think the angry grizz followed Todd down the hill to attack him again, or did they simply cross paths again, causing the second attack? Finally, which one do you think would be worse to deal with, an angry sow grizzly protecting her babies, or a tough Montanan who would take a lickin' and keep on ticking? I will be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.